değerli öğretim üyeleri ve değerli konuklar. Anadolu Üniversitesi'nin ev sahipliğinde gerçekleştirilen Uluslararası Açık ve Uzaktan Öğrenme Konferansı'nın ikinci gün etkinliklerine hoş geldiniz. Konferanslarımızı IODL başlıklarıyla açılan sosyal medya hesaplarımızdan takip edebilirsiniz. Değerli konuklar, şimdi konuşmalarını yapmak üzere UNESCO Uluslararası Açık ve Uzaktan Öğrenme Kurulu Başkanı Kanada Atabasco Üniversitesi'nden Profesör Doktor Rory McRill'ı kürsüye davet ediyorum. Somebody controlling the slides. I'm sorry, this is in Turkish. I can't understand it. No, it's not it. That's not the slides at all. It's uh, this one. Great. Can I press this button here? Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here in Turkey. I'd uh, like to start off with a, a personal story. Of uh, um, I've just come from uh, a conference in Ireland, and uh, I am Irish. I'm an immigrant to Canada. One in four people in Canada are immigrants. And uh, my father told me a story when I was very young that uh, in the Irish famine, where the population uh, went down from 8 million to less than 2 million, and which Ireland has never recovered from, the only people to help the Irish were the Turks. And uh, this uh, Sultan Abdul Masid sent, he wanted to send 10,000 pounds to Ireland to help the, re, the, the relief. And uh, they wouldn't let him, the British would not let him because Queen Victoria only gave 2,000 pounds. And so he gave 1,000 pounds, but in addition to that, he sent five ships uh, loaded with corn to help people. And perhaps uh, without this uh, uh, particular gesture, um, I may not even be here today. So I just thought I'd mention that, that it's, a, it's such a great pleasure for me to be in Turkey, and that's part of it, because these stories I heard when I was a little boy. Um, all these slides that I'm using today are Creative Commons license, so anyone can use them. And I talk a bit about Canada now. Uh, a great northern country, and uh, as you can see by the whiteness, uh, uh, you could understand one reason why it's another pleasure to be here in Turkey at the present time. It is now minus 14 and uh, blowing with snow. And here's a picture of us in a typical day. Of course, we can always laugh about it because uh, it can be funny. And of course, in Canada, we do have a summertime and it can be quite beautiful. This is our uh, campus in uh, northern Canada. I want to talk now about the challenge for the 21st century. By 2025, there'll be about 100 million uh, new students capable of post-secondary education, but without access. And to, uh, <coughs> to a achieve this challenge or to meet this challenge, we would have to build four universities per week of 30,000 students. So we must find new ways of delivering learning to masses of students. And uh, uh, John Daniels reminds us that the way to do this is through open and distance uh, learning. The main question, I believe, for educators in the 21st century is how to educate all of these learners. To understand this, we have to look at the economy and what's happening in the world. And we're making the transition now to the fourth stage, 
We went through the manufacturing uh, stage, the industrial revolution, and uh, the third, uh, the, in, uh, the internet stage, and now we're into the fourth of artificial intelligence stage of learning. The economic drivers in society are no longer transportation and manufacturing, but rather telecommunications and computing. This is a massive change in the structure of the economy. And all of these changes are based on bits of information. We tend to look at, when we're looking at our computers, that we get voice, we get data, and we get images. But in fact, all we have are bits, and it's the arrangement of bits uh, that is the main driving force in the modern economy. Nicholas Negroponte reminds us that these bits of information, they have zero mass, they have zero volume, they can be supplied infinitely at virtually no cost, and they move at the speed of light. We look at them as ones and zeros, but they are not ones and zeros. They are simply on-off switches. And the world economy today is based on these on-off switches. What's the difference between these two memory sticks? One is worth a dollar fifty. The other is worth a hundred and fifty thousand dollars. The only difference is that the bits are arranged differently on one than on the other. There's no production. It's just a rearrangement of bits of information. The world economy is based on this transformation. If we look at the top uh, companies in the world, um, starting with uh, Amazon, Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Facebook, what do they produce? For the most part, nothing. They just transform bits of information. That's what the world economy is based on. We seem to always think that the world economy is based on real products, and it isn't. It's based on these bits of information. Um, these companies are far bigger than the ones that are based on oil uh, or uh, uh, consumer goods or electronic goods. The digital economy is real, and it doesn't produce anything. It just rearranges bits. This is information, and you arrange them in a good way. You get knowledge, and you can find it. Well, guess what? We are educators. That's what we do. In northern Canada, we have one of the largest oil reserves in the world, but it's tied up in sand. It's called the, uh, uh, the uh, tar, tar sands, or oil sands, and we have to extract it, it's, it's uh, solid. And we say this is a great source of our wealth. But without the engineers, without the truckers, without the skilled tradesmen, without the financial people, all we have in Northern Canada is a pile of muck, dirt. That's all that's there. It's only when we transform it using knowledge that we get value. Value comes from knowledge now. We're in the knowledge economy in a very real sense, not in any sort of uh, hypothetical sense. And what do teachers do? Teachers help people to transform knowledge. They help people to learn. This is the basis of our economy. Now, the United States is a major exporter of cultural products and has therefore unsurprisingly made stronger copyright protection a core element of its trade strategy. 
So now the United States, followed uh, uh, particularly by Europe and Japan, are trying to control knowledge and keep it in a box so as they can profit by it. If you, this map is based on the amount of profit that comes from the knowledge economy, from royalties, copyright, patents, etc. And as you can see, uh, the United States is huge. It has uh, more than 50% of the world's royalties go to the United States. A huge number goes to Europe, a huge number goes to Japan. These uh, three um, organizations control the world economy because of this. However, we do know that this idea of ones and zeros, bits, on and off switches goes back in China for thousands of years uh, with the idea of the yin and the yang and all reality being divided into these two aspects. Of course, China gets no money in royalties for uh, uh, producing this. So what's happening, and the Singapore government noted this as far back as 25 years ago, that global competition in telecommunication is an overwhelming and irreversible tide. We can neither go against, alter, nor shut out this tide. We will simply be bypassed and rendered irrelevant. Well, I'd suggest to you that this is the same in education, that global competition in education is also overwhelming and irreversible. Aranovitz and DeFazio remind us that not only has abstract knowledge come to the center of the world's political economy, but there is also a tendency to produce and trade in symbolic significations rather than concrete products. Today, knowledge rather than traditional skill is the main productive force. Uh, the Irish poet Yeats put it more eloquently, the visible world is no longer a reality, and the unseen world is no longer a dream. We look at learning and training. Uh, going back from 2000, about 25% of the world economy. Uh, today uh, and in the future, we're looking at the majority of the world's economy is based on learning and training. And they say, well, what do you mean? Look at oh, the oil industry. The oil industry puts huge amounts of money into learning and training. The uh, car industry, the auto industry, every industry are consistently and continuously training their workforce. And so if you take learning and training across all of these different uh, um, economic uh, uh, areas, um, you will find that learning and training is the most important and the largest economic activity. Make no mistake about it, personal livelihoods are threatened, new markets are up for grabs, and national fortunes are at stake. And this all depends on our attitude to learning. Taichi Sakaya, the uh, Japanese uh, professor, wrote The Knowledge Value Revolution. And what he says is that knowledge has always been the basis of the economy. So, uh, for example, so you buy this little gadget. What are you buying? Is it the plastic? Is it the little bit of electronics in it? The plastic and the electronics in this is worth about maybe 40 or 50 cents. The knowledge in it is worth dollars. The knowledge is what's happening, is it's the knowledge that's embedded in the product. Even a simple uh, a glass of water, the knowledge embedded in putting out this around, around uh, 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 this, this uh, economy, this is not just about the water and the plastic. It's about the knowledge that we have that's embedded in the product. Excuse me. So let's get real. Kurzweil puts this graph out uh, as Kurzweil's law 
And what it looks like is that uh, things uh, in, in electronics, computers, uh, in uh, digitalization, went along smoothly until the 1990s. And suddenly, there was an explosion with the World Wide Web, the internet, the World Wide Web, and everything changed. But that's because we, as human beings, we think linearly. He put the same information on an exponential graph, and it's a straight line, going all the way back from uh, uh, the electromechanical age through uh, relay switches, vacuum tubes, transistors, uh, through integrated circuits. It was eminently predictable if we look at an exponential scale. But we don't think that way. We think linearly. And that's why it came as a surprise to us. So with this exponential scale, um, Kurzweil's predicting that a computer with more intelligence than a human being uh, will become around sometime next year. And that by 1930, um, there'll be computers that are far more intelligent than human beings. Of course, you have to take these exponential predictions with a grain of salt. Uh, because uh, when Elvis died, there were about 50 Elvis impersonators. Within 10 years, there were hundreds. Within 20 years, there were thousands. Within 30 years, there were 100,000 Elvis impersonators. If this trend continues, half the world will be Elvis impersonators by the next 10 years. So. We have to be careful when we're looking at these exponential predictions. Societies that have a strong, coherent sense of what is important and a collective will will probably be most successful. Now, distance education plays an important role in this economy. We have some people, we call them the educational Amish, um, the Amish are people in Canada who choose to live in the 19th century. They do not use any mechanical tools. They use only horses and carts and old 19th century technology. We have people today in education who still feel the same way about traditional education in the classroom. They say we call them the educational uh, creationists. They believe that God created the classroom a couple of thousand years ago. That's the only way to teach and that there is no other way of doing it. Well, guess what? Among the earliest records of the classroom is the Library of Alexandria in Egypt with Hero as the uh, principal. They had students come into a room to teach. And the reason they did that, there was only one reason, is because there was only one copy of the manuscript. There was no other way of teaching because they had the one copy. Today, we have billions of copies of manuscripts. Today, we have billions of copies. This classroom was not instituted for any pedagogical reason. It was instituted for a practical reason that there was no other way of doing it. Well, today we have quite a few different ways of doing it. Saul of Tarsus, uh, who came from uh, Eastern Turkey, um, you could call him the founder of distance education. He sent messages all around the known world at that time. And he was the first distance educator. With his manuscripts, which were duplicated by scribes, they were sent all around the world. And they formed a new way of learning, a possible way of learning. Uh, Gutenberg, 
When he invented the, the book, the printed book, the books were this big. And there was only one book in each university. And the only way you could access the knowledge was to go to the university and attend a lecture, as you can see these students are doing. And yes, they're still, even in those days, sleeping in the back of the classroom. This was Gutenberg's book. It still did not solve the problem. But along came uh, Aldo Manuzio, an Italian, in the 15th century, and he invented the portable book that you could carry with you. Then, again, you could learn otherwise than being in the classroom and listening to the lecturer. Now, community or accessibility. They ask this question, what technology has done more to destroy human community than any other. And some people, well, if you're in the United States, they'll say the gun. Uh, but uh, if uh, uh, others will say television or the internet. But in fact, uh, if you're on the internet, you're communicating with other people. If you're watching television, you're doing it with your family. Um, the technology that's done more to destroy community in education has been the portable book. With the portable book, you could learn without the teacher. You could learn on your own. And uh, um, the portable book has been one of the, uh, 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 the best ways that people could learn without attending lectures, without uh, working alone, without working in groups. I'd point your attention to Thomas uh, uh, Russell's no significant difference phenomenon. There are more than 355 studies that regardless of the technology or media, there is no significant difference. Whether you're in a classroom, out of a classroom, whether you're using television or radio, whether you're using the internet, whether you have uh, 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 different, whatever technology or media you're using, there's no difference in the achievement levels of students. So what can we say? Is this, that in traditional education, the emperor has no clothes. There is no evidence, and I'd I, I want to repeat this, there is no evidence that classroom-based teaching is better than any other form of teaching. I'm going to say it a third time. There is no evidence out there whatsoever. So if people are telling you that traditional education is better than online education, um, they have no evidence to support this. It is an educational uh, creationist argument. That is, they believe that God created the classroom and no other way is possible. And uh, there is such a thing as change and evolution and things, the world marches on. So I want to make that uh, point very clear here because there are too many people who still think that, oh, distance education is second best. Well, my argument is that not only is distance education not second best, but it's better than traditional education. In fact, if you're getting an education today and you're not online, you are not getting an education. It is not a modern education. If you're just sitting in a classroom and not using the internet, you are not getting an education. And there are no universities in Canada uh, and very few in the United States and Europe um, that do not have online learning. They all are engaged in online learning. In fact, you would be hard pressed to find any individual course in Canada, the United States or Europe that does not have an online component. If you're not online, you're not getting an education. And I think that we should stop um, defending distance education and start 
talking to the traditional educationists and telling them, what are you doing? How can your students survive in a modern economy if they're not online? Distance education, well, we call it Cinderella has become a princess. That where used to be everyone used to talk down their nose about distance education, now everyone is coming to us in open and distance learning to find out how to do it properly. The world is online. Another point I'd like to make is this whole, uh, how can I put it, this uh, trend towards learner-centeredness. And I, we're getting more and more articles, more and more people are doing their doctoral dissertations, and they're focusing on the learner. And they don't mention whether or not anybody learned anything. They say, oh, the students were satisfied, the students were happy, the students interacted, the students formed communities, the students did this, the students did that. They don't mention whether or not they learned anything. Well, if you're a teacher and you don't mention that the students learned anything, you're not a teacher. Your whole point is for them to learn. Your point is not to make students happy. Your point is to have them learn something. Now, if you can make them happy at the same time, I think that's a good thing. And if you can show that happiness increased achievement levels, that's very important. Did the lear students learn anything? This is a very important point, and I'm just seeing too much of this uh, learner-centeredness. How about games for learning? We can use all kinds of different games for learning, and they are very powerful. And uh, how many have heard of the measurement in computer games called the twitch? You know what a twitch is? This. That's a twitch. Well, in electronic game design, it's the amount of time it takes you to move a joystick in one direction or another, or to press a button. One twitch is equal to 200 milliseconds. Two jiffies are 200 milliseconds. In 200 milliseconds, electrons on a wire can travel 20,000 kilometers. Guess what? There is nowhere on Earth further away than 20,000 kilometers. What does that tell us? That God created the world for, for playing video games. This, is the, this was created perfectly for, creating, for, for playing video games. We see, need to look at them more closely in education and training. Um, I'm not going to talk today about MOOCs. We have some good uh, uh, presentations here about them. Um, I just want to say that uh, there's all different types of MOOCs, and the definition varies from whoever you're talking to. But the one thing I want you to remember is this. They were not invented in the United States. They were invented in Canada. Uh, George Siemens and Stephen Downs. I participated. I was one of the mentors in the first MOOC. Uh, but everyone, unless it happens in the United States first, nobody seems to pay any attention to it. There's been a shift in computing towards tablets and mobile phones, and desktops are gradually going out of style. There's a growing mobile workforce, worldwide 1.3 billion, um, in the Asia Pacific alone 838 uh, million. And what does this tell us is that the world is ripe for mobile learning. And I first got the idea of mobile learning in 1999. I was driving through a small village in the Philippine Islands, no electricity. There was a farmer up to a, 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 his knees in a rice field in the water, and he was digital messaging. I slammed on the brakes. I could not believe it, because in Canada, in 1999, Nobody was digital messaging. I checked it out, and in 1999, the Philippines did more digital messaging per person 
than any other country in the world. Today, I checked this year, they still do more digital messaging than any other country in the world. But what, what I was shocked by was that I knew that in his hands he had a powerful computer. It was more powerful than the computer I had on my desktop two years before that. That's when I started thinking that we need to look at this mobile learning. And of course, it's been growing ever since. And in fact, today, um, I would venture to, uh, to guess that more people are learning on mobile devices than in the classroom or by any other means. There are 3 billion internet connections out of a world population of 7.7 .7 billion. 40% of the world's population is on the internet. Most access the internet with mobile devices. There's 2.3 billion people have mobile broadband. Mobile mobility adoption is growing very rapidly. We're looking at mobile first, that people are using their mobile devices first before any other devices to access the internet. 51% of the world's population is online. Learning in the modern uh, workplace is people learn individually. They can learn as part of teams. They're learning from information support and they're learning from instruction. With mobile learning, four and a half billion mobile subscriptions in the world, one and a half billion mobile internet users. There's more time spent on the internet with mobile devices than with desktops. One out of three people only access the internet via mobile. So let's get real. The world economy is online. The world economy is global. Therefore, students should be online. Students should be global. Virtual mobility, we need to support this. This is the way the world is. If your students aren't online, they are not getting a, 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 an education. What does that tell us as teachers? Is this, design for mobile first. Don't design your classes for a textbook. Don't design your classes for a desktop. Design it for use on a mobile phone or a, or a tablet or both. So, as we say in the maritime region of Canada, let's wake up and smell the coffee. Of course, the first cell phone with a camera was, came in Canada. And uh, now, What's happening with mobile devices? We now have hearables. What are they? They're wireless smart computers with artificial intelligence, a speaker and a microphone. They fit in your ear and they connect to your iPhone or Samsung device and they're designed to be worn daily. It's a computer in your ear. They're tiny, they fit your ear canal, they're comfortable. Battery power is strong. They have an antenna, a microphone, and a microprocessor. Uh, they are the newest development from headphones, sound amplifiers, hearing aids, and earbuds. So it's a powerful computer in your ear. It cancels out unwanted background noise. It amplifies the voice of a particular person, and it can converse in another language. Of course, there's a stigma to these devices. When people see them, they think of old guys like me and uh, wearing a hearing aid, and we are not cool. We are not the cool people, so people don't want to imitate us. So what they're doing is they're designing them in different ways, so it'll be very cool to wear your, uh, uh, your hearable device. There's intelligent voice recognition with a virtual assistant. Um, some of the popular ones, I translate, Braggy Dash was one of the first. They're a subset of wearables, so it's a wearable computer, and they're a subset of audibles. You have like the Amazon Echo, or the Cortana, or Google uh, Assistant. And I can tell you, with this uh, uh, <laughs> Amazon Echo, I don't know how, how many of you are familiar with the Echo, the Amazon. 
you have it at home, it's in a box. And uh, I say, I get up in the morning, I'll say, good morning, Alexa. And she say, good morning. It is now 72 degrees and such and such. And the game, the game last night was the score and give me all kinds of information. And then I walk in the kitchen and my wife says to me, you never said good morning to me. <laughs> you say it to Alexa, but not to me. This is an interface revolution. Just-in-time learning is now possible. It is being used in many automotive factories where you learn as you're doing it and it leaves your hands free so as you can listen and do the work. A salesperson can learn on the job. Um, as she's going to meet a client, she can find out information about them. Great for self-directed learning personal learning, connectivism. Um, this is a story about Augustus Caesar of Rome. And when he was in the procession, he had his slave stand behind him and say to him, a whisper in his ear, you are not a god, you are a man. Remember, you are a man, you are not a god. And uh, I think that... Uh, these new hearable devices will be in your ear. They'll be able to let you know that. Uh, one guy told me, he says, it's like having a wife in your ear. Open educational resources are essential for this. We talked about the uh, American and European and Japanese, how they're trying to close off information to everybody in the world. And open educational resources are there to open up education for everyone in the world. UNESCO supports them as one of the main tools for achieving sustainable uh, development goal four, education for all. Uh, they're part of the Paris OER declaration from UNESCO. OER can not just be books, but they can be games, they can be videos, they can be podcasts, they can be many different things. They are all licensed, and the, li the most useful license today is the Creative Commons license. Now, why open education resources? Two reasons, DRM and digital licenses. I call it digital restrictions management. DRM are locks that they put on your device to stop you from copying, text-to-speech, format changing, printing out, moving geographically, use after expiry date. DRM is a lock that restricts your device. It controls how you use your device. But our device is our property. It restricts our freedom. And this is the question. Can we not own and control our own property? Like right now you get your, you get your phone and companies, they put their application on and they put in locks in order to control how you use your property. They put handcuffs on us, but we're innocent. We've done nothing wrong. They've even tried to destroy devices that if you break the copy protection, uh, they will destroy your device. And uh, on top of that, and more insidious are the digital licenses because to be honest, any graduate of computer science, if they can't break a lock, they have no business graduating. Anyone can break a lock. I've got to finish up now, so <laughs> I'll go quickly. Digital licenses, they prohibit you from even showing your content to others. We cannot use this in, uh, in education. We must have freedom to copy and change and move our information. Vendors control how, when, where, and with what specific brands of technological assistance audiences are able to access. It's a new world we live in. You buy, but you don't get. Do you remember the world we used to live in? Where if you bought something, nobody could tell you how you use it. If you buy a hammer, nobody can tell you what nails to use. It's a different world we live in now. I'm going to skip to the end now. 
Openness is the skeleton key that unlocks every attempt at vendor control and lock-in. So if we go with open education resources, they cannot stop us from doing the things we need to do as educators. Uh, I recommend this book at the Commonwealth of Learning, Open Educational Resources Policy. The Knowledge Cloud is uh, 3,000 articles and reports on OER. And I'm going to go quickly to the end now because I, I uh, got carried away telling you stories. This is important. White size. Professor says that affordability in the future may be the first requirement, not an afterthought. The race may not be to the swift, but to the cheap. We've got to find ways of delivering cost-effective education to our students. And I'm finishing off now with this story about the frog. They say, if you put a frog in water and slowly heat it up until it boils, the frog won't jump. And uh, I say this story because the technology is bubbling all around us and we've got to jump. If we don't jump, we'll be cooked. Well, I put this story out on the internet and I got an email back from another country and he said, very sorry, Dr. McGrail, uh, but I must inform you that at 44 degrees Celsius, a knee-jerk reaction in the something-something tendon of the right interior something-something else caused the, ca the frog to automatically jump from the water. And I thought, oh my God, there's people all around the world putting frogs in water because, and boiling it because of my story. So I had to put out a disclaimer. I had to say, look, I come from the Eastern Maritime region of Canada, and there we do not let facts interfere with a good story. So I'll finish with that. Thank you very much for your attention. It's a pleasure talking to everybody. Değerli hocamıza sunumundan dolayı teşekkür ediyoruz ve teşekkür plaketi vermek istiyoruz. Plaket takdimi için Ayodiyal Organizasyon Komitesi Başkanı Profesör Doktor Sayın Volkan Yüzeri sahneye davet ediyorum. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Hocam, sahnenin ortasına da geçebilirsiniz. Lütfen.